In this video, we're going to walk through the Microsoft Lab about designing an IP addressing scheme for our Azure deployment. Now, this lab is particularly interesting to me because of the fact that what they're talking about here in this lab is not specifically restricted to Azure, but can be utilized for both physical environments as well as other cloud environments such as AWS or other cloud service providers. Uh, here in the lab, it starts off and it starts talking about how a good Azure IP addressing scheme uh, provides flexibility, room for growth, and integration with other networks. That's not just Azure, that's really any IP addressing scheme inside an organization or outside the organization. So we're gonna walk through this lab and it will walk us through kind of the ideas behind setting up a good addressing scheme, as well as then how to actually set this up in Azure itself. So let's go ahead and take a look. We'll jump into, first off, the introduction. Uh, talks about how maybe you're the solution architect for a company and your company wants to move to Azure. So obviously as a good network engineer or good solutions architect, I know that I need to plan ahead uh, for both my public and private IP addresses. Public IP addresses in Azure are actually so easy to work with that I don't really need a plan for those, but the private IP addresses I do. Uh, all right, next. Talks about integration. So on a traditional on-premise network environment, uh, you will have a diagram similar to this. You may have created something similar and you have gone ahead and you have maybe IP'd all of these environments uniquely. Uh, so for instance, maybe this group of computers over here, this is in the 10.10.1.0 slash 24 network. And then this group of computers over here is in the 10.10.2.0 slash 24 network. And then maybe all of our core network gear is in a di an additional 10.10.3.0 slash 24 network. And so you've gone ahead and you've created all of these together, uh, even to the point to where your perimeter network or your DMZ has its own IP address range such as 10.10.254.0 slash 24. By doing this, very briefly, by coming up with a plan for all of this, of how all of this works, it makes it very easy to be able to say, oh, well, if I'm going to add another computer to this network, which IP range does it get? Or if I add an additional access layer over here, what IP range does it get? Or if I added a new switch or a new router or load balancer uh, or new system in my DMZ, which IP addresses do these get? It allows for flexibility, it allows for growth, and it allows for easy management. Now, as it says, yeah, this is a very simplified network. Uh, small organizations may look like this, but it is a very simplified uh, environment. Uh, let's see, a little bit more information. Yep, private IP addresses. Private IP addresses are almost always in that range, and I say almost always because some people actually run public IP addresses on their private networks. Very rare. Uh, let's see, Azure IP addressing in Azure, they change things around a little bit. Instead of having that network diagram up above, uh, what we have is a network diagram that looks similar to this. Uh, in this case, we have what's called a virtual network, which is the entire round area right here. This might be akin to a physical building. You might think of this as being a physical location or a physical office location that you then have like multiple floors and multiple departments inside of it. Inside the virtual network, you then create subnets that have various ranges. The subnets could be say in a multi-floor office building, uh, first floor, second floor, third floor. Uh, you may have a subnet for HR Therefore, you would have a subnet here for HR. Uh, so the subnet idea translates the same. The virtual network is, again, kind of akin to a physical location. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Let me throw in really quick. Uh, the virtual network you see here is a 10, 10, 0, 0, slash 16, which means that includes 10.10.1.0 all the way through 10.10.254. Dot zero. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then these backend subnets 10, 10, 20 is a member of that virtual network. 10, 10, 10, again, a member of the virtual network. Uh, let's see, basic properties of virtual networks. Yep. You can grow them, shrink them. Uh, integration with on premise networks. And this is where the complication comes in for some people. And they actually give an example here. If you're using 192.168.00/16 on premise, then you can't use 192.168.10.0/24 on Azure because they conflict. You can't have the same IP address or the same IP address range in two different locations. Uh, therefore, they can't. They they would not work together. Uh, so you do have to have some thinking, some planning ahead. Uh, before you start configuring these IP ranges. All right, let's go ahead next. Uh, public private IP, yeah, public and IP address, public, ah, public and private IP addresses. Uh, for public, there are both dynamic and static. Uh, dynamic, well, you turn on the computer and it gets a dynamic address. Uh, static, well, you can keep the same IP address as you move forward. Uh, yeah, so dynamic pub, uh, dynamic public IP addresses. As you turn on the computer, you get allocated a virtual uh, an IP address with that virtual machine, and that IP can change every time you reboot the computer. Uh, this is dynamic, and therefore DNS is a great way to work with that. The other option is a static public IP address, in which case you purchase or rent the IP address from Azure, and then you always keep using that IP address whether the computer is turned on or not. Uh, so there is a small monthly fee included with it, but it makes it so you don't have to have such a dynamic IP addressing space. Uh, then talks about basic and standard SKUs. This is fairly new. It used to be the basic was the only choice when you got an IP address, and it gives a breakdown of what those, what the definition of a basic IP SKU is. Uh, you then have the standard SKU, which is a newer environment. The main breakdown I have taken from looking at these, the basic are open by default. Let's see, where does it say that? Uh, all right, it says it in here somewhere. Uh, it is open by default. There we go. Basic IPs are open by default and not protected by any firewall. Therefore, you have to configure network security groups in order to restrict traffic. Standard IPs, however, are secured by default and closed to all inbound traffic. And therefore, you have to use a network security group to allow traffic. So basic, imagine it doesn't have a firewall in it. Standard, imagine it does have a firewall already there. Uh, all right. Planning for our networks uh, talks about gathering your requirements, and this is going to be some pretty basic uh, network sizing requests here, uh, such as how big is your network, how many devices are going to be on it, uh, how many, how much growth might you need in the future, uh, both on an individual subnet as well as additional subnets, uh, any kind of isolation of services and firewalls and so on. All right, let's get into developing of our network. So in this scenario, we're actually going to be creating this network diagram right here. Let me go ahead and open that in a new tab. There we go. Uh, so in this scenario, we have a current on-premise location. Uh, our physical building, we have gone ahead and we've planned it out uh, to where everything in our network is within the 10.10.00/16 range. We want to expand our environment uh, to where we have a data center in the West, West India, somewhere on the West US, as well as somewhere in North Europe. Because of that, we're going to then 
have different uh, virtual networks in each of those locations. So 10.10 .10 is on premise. What we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, anything that is 10.20 is going to be in the West US. This simple, super simplification of our IP addressing here makes routing management a whole lot easier. Uh, so that's the West US. Everything that's 10.30 will be North Europe. And then anything that is 10.40, uh, more specifically 10.40.40 will be West India. Uh, we can see here in the West US, yeah, we're, we're assigning a full slash 16. We're only using three of those subnets, which allows us to have lots of additional room for growth. Same thing for North Europe and then West India, the decision is being made that there isn't necessarily any need for growth and therefore a single slash 24 is sufficient for everything. So let's get into this. We will go ahead and we'll create our virtual networks and then we'll create the subnets in each of these virtual networks together. All right, uh, lab is good, great. Uh, so there's there's our network diagram. Here is a breakdown or a spreadsheet of what that's actually going to look like from an IP range. Uh, most likely you have something like this in your existing environment. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're going to create our Azure network. Let me go ahead and copy and paste this and we'll talk about it as it's running. Uh, with most of these uh, Azure CLI commands, I like to read them backwards. We're going to create a virtual network in our networks of Azure. Uh, the resource group we're using, that's already assigned to us from this lab. Uh, if, we, if this was our own environment, we may actually create a resource group specifically for our network environments. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to name this virtual network Core Services VNet. Uh, if we look back at our diagram here, and I can't uh, can't shrink back in, uh, but our core services VNet is the VNet that is going to be here in the West US. Uh, the address prefix 10.20.0.0 slash 16 and the location West US. All right, now that I've created the VNet, let's create all of those subnets inside of it. Before I copy paste this, we'll look at it. So we're going to create a subnet in a VNet for our networks in Azure. Again, the resource group associated with it, the VNet that we want to create this subnet in, in this case, the core services VNet that we just created. What do we want to call this? We'll call it the gateway subnet. And what address size or address prefix do we want it to have? In this case, it's a 10.20.0.0 slash 27. So we're not using a full slash 24 simply because it's a gateway subnet and doesn't need that many IP addresses. We're then going to do the same thing for our other shared services subnets, our core service subnet, and our public web service subnet. Let's go ahead and copy that and paste it in. While that's running, I'm actually going to open up the Azure portal. And, and we should be able to see this virtual network and subnets created. If I go under all resources, I will see there is my virtual network called Cloud Services VNet. If I open that up, we should be able to see our various subnets right there. And there are our subnets available to us. Uh, we can see in here, how many IPs are currently in use and how many are available. Uh, 251 is the default for a slash 24 network simply due to the default IP rate, IPs used by Azure or routing and other permissions. All right, so we created our first virtual network. If we look back at our diagram here, we created our West US uh, virtual network called Core Services VNet along with our one, two, three, four, VLANs or subnets inside of them. Great. Let's move forward. Uh, in this case, let's, um, yeah, let's list those out. This is just going to give us a list of all those subnets, which we actually just looked at through the Azure portal. Uh, we can see our gateway subnet, shared services, database, public, 
All right, so that was our core services. Now let's create our manufacturing VNet, which I believe was going to be in Europe. All right, manufacturing VNet. So that's gonna be 103000. Like I see there, 103000 slash 16. Location is going to be in the North Europe data center. Copy that, paste it in. And then when that's done, I'll go ahead and copy and paste in our subnet creation. And this is where planning things out works really helpful. In theory, we had gone ahead and we'd created this network diagram to be able to figure out what networks we wanted or where. When we were done with that network diagram, we came over here and we created our spreadsheet right here that told us exactly which networks are in which subnets, in which locations, with which names. Once we have done that, well, we pretty much just create our scripts here based off of that information. We then copy and paste that into the Azure Cloud Shell and it creates it all for us without having to worry about mistyping something or forgetting one of our networks. All right, we check it one more time, this time looking for the VNet of manufacturing VNet. This should give us a list of the subnets we just created in that VNet. Uh, manufacturing, sensor one, sensor two, and sensor three. And then lastly, the research virtual network. Uh, this one's gonna be fairly simple. It's only gonna be one network and one subnet. I'll just go ahead and copy and paste those in. At this point, those commands should look extremely similar to you. There we go. And then we can confirm by seeing a list. And in this case, there's only one subnet on that virtual network, and therefore we only see the one subnet. If I now look back in my Azure environment and I go into all resources and refresh my page here, I will now see my three different virtual networks, my core services, which we which was the first we created, a virtual network, I'm sorry, manufacturing, which we can see over here is in North Europe, and then research, which is in West India. And then we can open these up and look at the individual subnets in them to confirm that they actually match our desired environment. All right, check my work, and it will tell me if I got it right or not. Kind of hard to miss this one since it is mostly just copy and paste, but that means that we went ahead and we looked through a network diagram. We came up with a network diagram, probably in a different step, and we said this is what we want our environment to look like, both on-premise as well as how we want to interact with these other locations. We then defined our IP subnetting ranges for each of those locations and each of the necessary subnets in between, leaving plenty of room to grow as needed. So for instance, if the core services VNet here, uh, if 10.20.00 runs out of room, I could then create another in West US uh, using 10.21.0.0 slash 16. So it leaves plenty of room for growth, both inside the VNet as well as inside the region, as well as beyond if I needed to include additional regions in the future. Once I had this network diagram, I used the spreadsheet uh, or I converted it into a spreadsheet, which can then easily be converted into individual power uh, Azure CLI commands to quickly and easily create all of these VNets for me without issue.